Tonight on Another Thing About Tartan, we welcome Robin Robinson from New Jersey to tell us his story. Robin is a private consultant to the American craft whiskey industry, where he helps small brands identify their unique stories. Robin also has a lifelong love for single malt Scotch whiskey and is the author of The Complete Whiskey Course, a comprehensive tasting school in 10 classes. And tonight he's here to share with us his wealth of whiskey knowledge. Welcome, Robin. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks, Emily. It's great to be here with you. Yeah. Now, before we go much further, I really must admit when it comes to whiskey, I am a complete novice, Robin. So I'm looking forward to hearing your tips on how to start my journey into the world of whiskey. Well, that's why I wrote this book. For 11 years, right up until COVID, I taught the longest running whiskey class in the United States here in New York City. Oh. So I live, right out, I live right outside New York City. And so I had, you know, 11 years. And also prior to that, you know, I, I worked with a, a brand called Compass Box, which okay. is a, an artisanal uh, blended Scotch whiskey. And um, I was their U.S. brand representative. So I've spent most of my time working with consumers. And yeah. uh, the biggest complaint or the biggest comment that I heard from the consumers it was, well, I'm not really a connoisseur. <laughs> and um, I was always a little taken back by that comment because, um, especially in the United States, uh, where connoisseurship is sort of, uh, you know, it almost has a political overtone of being elitist and, you know, and being from not from middle America. And uh, my response is always, um, but of course you are. Uh, you are the master of your own tastes. Mm. And uh, the things that you taste and that you sense are the same things that I do, uh, except that I've had a little bit more practice in putting a word to it. Right. And that's yeah. pretty much it. So everyone's sort of born with the same equipment, you know. Um, our, yeah. our, um, uh, I say our flavor background has a lot to do with it as well. So, uh, for example, I grew up, believe it or not, Robin Robinson, I grew up in a Middle Eastern family. And so I'm very sensitive to spices and herbs from the Middle East. I'm not going to pick those things right up. But as an adult, I had to learn what lemongrass was because that was something completely foreign to me growing up, for example. So um, when I wrote the book, uh, the book is really kind of like uh, uh, the way that I look at it is um, if you want to learn how to swim, how to get into the water and how to get your, your strokes so that you won't drown and that you feel comfortable, you read my book. My book yeah. gets you into the pool. It gets you acclimated to the water. It gets um, you know, all of that stuff around you so that you feel good. And so later on, if you want to go, you know, skin diving off the Azores, if you want to go jumping off the cliffs of, uh, of Acapulco, you feel comfortable, you feel confident, and that's yeah. where it takes you. So. Oh, well, it sounds like exactly what I need then. Yeah. So I believe you started out in acting and then went into technology sales. So how did all of that experience lead you to working in the whiskey business? Well, it was when I was an actor is where I got my first um, taste of four words that I had never heard before in my life, which was single malt scotch whiskey. And um, I was hired to impersonate a Scotsman. Oh. Now, you got to remember that the only Scots accent I've ever heard at that time, and I know that everybody who's Scottish is just cringing when they hear it. <laughs> But the only Scott that I had ever heard at that time, this was back in the 1980s here in New York City, um, was um, Lieutenant Scott from the series Star Trek. So that was right. the only time I'd ever heard of a Scott. So I just copied that. And I was a pretty good mimic. And yeah. uh, I was hired to impersonate a Scottish distiller. Oh, okay. Again, a word I had never heard of. I, I have no idea what it distiller is. Yeah, understandably. Um, to to lead uh, a bunch of very rich people up on Park Avenue through a um, a dinner tasting, a pairing of single malt Scotch whiskey. So I'm completely ignorant. Um, I was given some 
pamphlets and a magazine or two to read up on, because of course there, at that time there was no internet. And I practiced my Scots accent everywhere I went. And um, I got up there and they were more ignorant than I was, so it was perfect. And uh, I remember the four whiskeys that we had and um, the next day when they paid me in cash, um, I went out and bought my first bottle of single malt Scotch whiskey which was a, a, a 12 year old McAllen for the ungodly price of 1995 at that time. And, uh, and sort of the love affair was, was, was started. Yeah. And at that time it was very, very difficult to find single malt Scotch whiskeys anywhere. Oh, okay. um, you would, you had some Glenn Livid coming into the United States. You had some Glenn Fittick. Um, some uh, Lafroigs were showing up. McAllen was actually being probably promoted more than anything else. And uh, so it was very difficult to find them. Um, later on, I, I, left, um, I left show business and I found another path and another calling, which was in the world of technology. And I uh, ended up being a, a sales rep for a number of different Silicon Valley startup uh, technology mm -hmm. firms uh, back in the 1990s and yeah. uh, the early 2000s. Okay. And now um, I had this passion for single malt Scotch whiskey and I had an expense account. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, so that really worked out real well. Yeah, I um, can imagine. So I would always make sure that I took clients out to places that had single malt Scotch whiskey. And um, I'll never forget uh, my manager and I were visiting a client in St. Paul, Minnesota. So St. Paul is the twin sister to Minneapolis, or the twin okay. city of Minneapolis. And we were actually doing a deal with the St. Paul companies, which was a big insurance company. So we check into the, um, into the, uh, the St. Paul hotel and we had agreed to meet in the bar for a drink and some dinner. And I get into my room up, I'm unpacking and the, the phone uh, rings and my manager's on the phone yelling loudly at me, you have to get down here, you have to get down here, you have to get down here. And he's in the bar. So I'm going, okay. So I run down there and for the first time in my life, I see this massive wall of whiskey. Now this is uh -huh. in, I'd say this is in the late 1990s now. Okay. So, it's like no one, you know, no one displayed whiskeys like this before. And it was backlit and was very dramatic and all the bottles were placed perfectly. And oh my, and I can see why he was yelling at me. So we spent the rest of the evening just there, you know, tasting all the whiskey. So um, by the time the 2000s rolled over, I had already started a blog. Um, I had formed a tasting group of uh, of people in my neighborhood um, yeah. and we called ourselves the knuckleheads of Scotch because we knew nothing about Scotch whiskey yeah. but then yeah, we were knuckleheads and yeah. we just started learning and uh, sharing information sharing bottles and now we're starting to see a couple stores that are starting to actually um, stock um, a lot of a range of Scotch whiskey so as the 2000s are moving. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've got this passion, I've got this other career. And then an old friend of mine who's in the liquor industry, as a matter of fact, he's third generation uh, in the, the, the distribution layer here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, known him for, for decades and invited him to a, a number of these um, Scotch whiskey tasting that I was sponsoring. And one day he said, you know, you're in the wrong industry. Uh, you know more about whiskey than people who work for me. And why are you <laughs> selling technology? You know? And so one day he actually made me an offer uh, to come into the liquor industry um, in the role of the brand ambassador, but a brand oh. ambassador who was a salesperson. So mm -hmm. that, you know, the, because of my sales background, I would help transform that role from just a sort of a presentational, educational role 
into, you know, a very effective sales um, uh, entity. And that's what I did. Yeah. So, that's like the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was back in January that we first met at the American Scottish Foundation's Brunch Supper, um, held in the beautiful University Club, right in just off Fifth Avenue. So that's where you uh, you told me some stories that night. So yeah, I, I got a small in, insight into to your career <laughs> as far. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that was a lovely place. It was a wonderful event too. So uh, oh, yeah. I had been yeah. doing that for a number of years. Of course, this was the first time in two years that it had. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That had, had uh, occurred yeah, again. Nice it was really to get, wonderful to be there. Well, exactly. Get back out there and let people taste some more. So. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So obviously, aside from your love of single malt uh, Scotch whiskey, you spend most of your time working with small American craft whiskey producers. So, can you tell me what the differences between American and Scottish whiskeys are? Well, once made in Scotland. Of course, yeah. <laughs> the location got to but, uh, no, yeah. I, I say that as a joke. I say that as a joke, but believe it or not, and I, again, I cover this in my book, um, that's, a, that's a question of, a lot of people. Is, is bourbon a whiskey? Is scotch a whiskey? Right? Um, and so I have like a, I've got an infographic in there that kind of explains that. But, um, there, so everything is a whiskey that is made from beer. So if you take beer, which is just grains that have been fermented into an alcohol, right? And you mm -hmm. take that and you put it into some sort of distilling device, you know, like a pot still or a column still. Um, and, you know, you, you manage the alcohol level inside the still to a certain degree, then it's whiskey, right? Okay. And now after that, different countries, have different rules about what they call whiskey. So in the UK and in um, Ireland and in Canada, uh, they've got very, and in the EU as well, um, they've got very specific um, regulations around that. So whiskey, um, again, made from grains, a mass of grains, distilled to a certain you know um, level of alcoholic proof, bottled at a minimum, proof and then it, it stored in a in an oaken container um no less than three years that's critical mm -hmm. no less than three years so in scotland what they say is that grain is barley and other grains so that right. the main ingredient in scotch whiskey is barley okay and then other grains. And what that means is that in Scotch whiskey, there are two types, five categories, and three of them have the word blend in it. Mm -hmm. So the two types of whiskey in Scotland are malt whiskey made from 100% malted barley and cooked in a pot still. And then there's something called grain whiskey, which is made from other grains besides barley. Okay. And cooked in one of these big, massive column stills. Yeah. That's the two types. The five okay. categories are single malt from one single distillery, single grain from one single distillery, blended scotch. So when I take grain whiskey and malt whiskey, blend those together, I get J&B, Cuddy Sark, Johnny Walker, Dewar's, Chivas, all of the, the blended stuff. And then there's a blended malt when I just blend a single malt with no grain whiskey. And then there's a very rare category called blended grain when I just blend grain whiskeys from different distilleries but with no malt. So oh, that's scotch whiskey by go. regulations. They were recently yeah. updated in 2009. American whiskey all over the map, <laughs> okay. literally all over the map, right? But the one American whiskey that most people are familiar with and that are concerned with is bourbon. Mm -hmm. So bourbon is just one type of American whiskey. There are many types of American whiskey. Anything made in America, um, obviously, is an American whiskey. Um, they've got similar requirements, you know, inside of the, you know, the, grain, the mash of, of grains, you know, and um, uh, the, the, the distillation um, uh, tech, uh, distillation protocol as well. Okay. 
bourbon, for example, can go no higher than 80% inside the still, whereas whiskey in America and in Scotland can go up to 95%. Oh. Okay. Um, also, um, it, it could be made in any state in the United States. A lot of people think that bourbon can only be made in Kentucky, but that's only if it, the label says Kentucky bourbon. And, oh. um, and then it has to be aged in a new charred oaken container. Now, they don't say barrel, which means you could put it in a box if you want to. <laughs> and they don't give a minimum amount of time that you have to keep the whiskey in that container. So oh. legitimately, you could take some whiskey, put it in a new charred oaken container, and then dump it right out, put it in a bottle, and you could call that bourbon. Yeah. Now, okay. then there are other things called rye whiskey, where the dominant grain is rye. Uh, in bourbon, the dominant grain is corn. There's wheat whiskey, where the dominant grain is wheat, and then on and on and on. Um, okay. I've seen some really interesting stuff. Um, and, and, and you find this in the craft industry, because all the craft distillers have taken all of the old rules and just kind of thrown them away. Yeah. And, um, are doing things that, you know, so I'm seeing like whiskey made from millet, okay. whiskey, whiskey made from amaranth, uh, whiskey made from quinoa, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, and so, you know, the, the four primary grains uh, are uh, corn, wheat, rye, and barley because they yield the most sugar. And that's, that's what the Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, I didn't realize that it was so much kind of a wider spectrum of kind of options in, in the States. Well, when you think about it, whiskey is a major, uh, is a major economic driver. For mm. example. Now in Scotland, for example, the biggest economic driver in Scotland is oil. Right. Um, and, uh, but whiskey is up there, you know, and yeah. so when you have a product like that, you, you're going to form protections around it. So to, to, to keep it, um, in its uh, in, in its pure state, and yeah. Yeah. some people argue with that. You can argue with that and say, okay, well, that's kind of like you know, stodgy and everything like that. But it does uh, protect the product from uh, mm -hmm. you know diverging into something else that's not that product. So yeah, okay, it kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense, and. Obviously, we've talked a lot there about Scotland and the US, and we quickly mentioned a few other countries. So I know that there's a lot of Irish and Canadian and Japanese whiskies, but are there any other big whiskey producing countries that might not be so well known? Well, those are the big five. So in no order of, of size, you've got the United States, Canada, um, Japan, Ireland, and Scotland, right? So those are the big five. Here's what's interesting about the 21st century. We're getting whiskey coming out of places that we never thought whiskey would come from. I mean, yeah. Whiskey from Taiwan, whiskey from India. I mean, I'm not talking about the, the stuff that they pass off as whiskey in India that's sold only um, inside the, the, the subcontinent of India, which is mm. something completely different. It's actually based on molasses as opposed to grain. But I'm talking about world-class single malt whiskey. Um, we're getting uh, whiskey from um, Wales, um, whiskey from England, whiskey from uh, uh, Australia, from Tasmania, from the Czech Republic, from Germany, from Denmark, from Sweden. Uh, France is just making whiskey like crazy, whoever would have thought of it. Right? And um, what's interesting is every one of them uh, looks to Scotland as its sort of spiritual godfather, let's put it that way, right? Yeah. Which means that the way that they're making it is in the Scottish style, which is essentially 100% malted barley that's oh. made in a pot still. It's only when you come to the United States and Canada do you see big variations of that. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, Bourbon is made from a recipe of grains called a mash bill. And there's typically two or three or sometimes even four grains in that mash bill led by corn. In oh. Canada, 
um, every one of their whiskeys is, um, every one of their grains is um, fermented, distilled, and then aged separately. So all of their corn whiskey is distilled, aged, and fermented separately, as is their uh, rye, as is their barley, and, and is their wheat. And then when those barrels get to their maximum ripeness, so to speak, then they blend them together and they make all of these different styles of Canadian whiskey. Okay. Um, so that's a very different way of making it. But uh, yeah. for the rest of the world, they kind of follow the Scottish model. And that includes um, Ireland and Japan as well. Um, okay. There's a very famous story about Japanese whiskey about a man uh, named Masataka Akatsuru who came, who was traveled to Scotland for three years in the early 1920s and apprenticed at all of these distilleries in the lowlands, primarily in Campbellton and in uh, around Glasgow, okay. uh, and then took that knowledge back with him and helped to create uh, the Japanese whiskey industry. So, oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Scotland's got a lot to answer for then. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, okay, it's funny. Um, uh, if, when you look historically, um, uh, you can make the argument that Ireland invented whiskey and Scotland perfected it. Um, okay. But, you know, th that's an argument that uh, I only get into when I've had yeah. a whiskey at the end of the bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. A difficult one to stay neutral from, I imagine. Yeah. I typically yeah. will just oh, throw that comment and duck and then just like, you know, see what happens. Yeah, exactly. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's much debate following that. <laughs> there is, yeah. And it's a great debate, too. It's like one of the best debates going because yeah. they're both right, you know, in a yeah. way. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. And so obviously we've been talking about the, the book and the fact that there are the 10 classes, you know, on how to taste within that. So how did the book come about and what, what would I expect to learn throughout those courses? Well, well, the book came out of the class that I taught um, uh, one day after my class. And the class typically is about 36 people. It's a beautiful space in downtown Manhattan um, that unfortunately has been closed since COVID, but it was a fantastic um, uh, amphitheater type of, you know, okay. so there was, you know, uh, two rows of, of seating. Uh, the presenter was down at the bottom, had video screens and refrigerators and, and all kinds of things. It's a, a really terrific space. So one day, about four years ago, um, one of the students came up and introduced himself. He was an editor from a publishing house. And the publisher had done some very, very important books in the food and wine and spirits world, uh, including um, one that is pretty much seen as the, the standard reference book for wine. And it's oh. called... Um, the Windows on the World Complete Wine Course. And it was written by a guy named Kevin Zraeli. And he wrote the first edition of this 35 editions ago. So he sold over 3 million oh, wow. of these books since then. Uh, it's a very popular book, very well written, really nicely illustrated, big format book. Hmm. And um, about 12 years ago, they had taken that idea and they went to a guy who was a beer writer and they asked him, can you write the complete beer course? So he did. And then the, one of the editors said, but, you know, whiskey is like the hot thing right now. And that would kind of complete the trifecta. We need someone to yeah. write this whiskey course. And that's how they found me. So they came to my class. Uh, we started conversations after that, and about a year later, about a year later, I uh, I signed a contract with them and then started writing the book. Yeah, I bet that must have been quite exciting then. Yeah, it was. It was very exciting. Uh, it was nerve wracking. I had to be. Uh, I had to be. Uh, this is my first time writing a book, so I had to be talked down off the cliff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be able to do this. It was overwhelming. Uh, I was working under constrictors that I wasn't used to. I was working with an editor, and, you know, whenever yeah. I wrote before, I wrote whatever I decided to write. You know, no one yeah. was telling me, okay, change that. But yeah. So, um, uh, but it was wonderful. I, I really, I think I, I, I learned a lot uh, about oh, how, to, and how to write better. And, um, 
And what I did was I, instead of writing it from my office, which I probably could have done, I had the good fortune of being able to travel around the world. And so I spent a good four or five months on an airplane from Japan to India to um, uh, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, down through Kentucky. Um, prior to that, you know, I had been to a lot of distilleries throughout my life. Um, I worked with uh, small, you know, uh, craft distilleries. But I wanted to get out and talk to the people who were making whiskey in the place where they were making it and ask them very, very specific questions yeah. uh, about how it's made and why it's made and where it's made. And, and that was just an unbelievable experience I had. Um, I, I talked yeah. to three distillers in, in Japan. Uh, I talked with a, a dozen distillers in Scotland and another eight or nine in Ireland, Canada, about four of them, uh, Kentucky, about 12 of them, um, you know, and then other people who I'd known because I was in the industry, I was able to, uh, to have um, phone and email conversations that were substantive, yeah. um, that really, again, it brought a lot of insights to me that I, you know, mm -hmm. I hope I passed on in the book. Yeah. Well, I imagine there's probably nothing quite like that. You see being there in the setting and they can actually show you then rather than just having to describe it to you. So. Not only that, but, you know, uh, one of the most wonderful things about going to a distillery, and I, have you ever been to a distillery yourself? Um, do you know what? I don't think I have, actually. Okay. So one of the most wonderful things about a distillery is the smell. Okay, yeah. There is a smell inside of a distillery that is completely unique to the smell. And, you know, smell is so essential to our enjoyment of whiskey that, um, uh, you know, our, our olfactory sense and our, and, and our taste buds, uh, our whole organoleptic uh, um, construction is very, very primal to us as human beings. And it really, you know, it, 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 it gets into parts of your brain uh, that are very, very deep and very primal. And when you walk into a distillery, uh, when you walk into the mass room and you smell the fermenting mass, there's nothing like that. When you walk into the distillery and you smell that fermented mass being vaporized into alcohol, and then when you walk into the warehouse or the dunnage and you smell that alcohol then uh, humidifying inside of this place and then turning into whiskey, it's there, it's just it's amazing, and and um, it, it it leaves a very deep impression on everyone who does it. And uh, so I definitely recommend uh, go out and get yeah. into a distillery, as they would say. Yeah, well, the reason it took me so long to answer your question is I knew I had been when I was in Tobermory, but of course, it's been during the pandemic. So they were still had sort of the store side of it open, but not the actual tours because right. of everything that yeah. was going on. So I was like, oh, I can't quite think because I knew I'd been at the building. But yeah, I'll definitely need to uh, so go back. You were that close. Exactly. And, yeah, and the, uh, and uh, are you from the are you from the uh, the Western Islands or you are you because that's no, an interesting uh, place to go. Yeah, the so Island I'm North. in the down in the Scottish borders, so that's where our company headquarters are based. But okay. obviously, when we weren't able to travel abroad during the pandemic, then you you travel more at home, don't you? So oh sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. My first real distillery experience was in Scotland. Um, I had never been to a actual distillery before, but I fell in love with Callister um, okay. from the Isle of Skye, and I wrote Mr. Callister a letter, not knowing who Callister or what that was, um, yeah. and I got a an, I got a response back from uh, I believe it was a man named Ian McDonald who was the production manager at, at the distillery, and this was back in the 1980s. And I kept that I kept that letter for ten years, and when I finally got to Scotland, I got to Scotland in 1998, and um, we went to Skye. I took my wife, my nine-year-old daughter, and I said, "We're going to go to Skye." And 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 to this day, that's like one of my 
you know, I tell people, put this on your bucket list before you die, go to mm-hmm. Sky, because it's just one yeah. of the most beautiful places on earth. It really is. And uh, we knocked at the distillery door. They, the lady wasn't expecting us, you know, she wanted to know why we were there. I, you know, uh, they gave us yeah. a tour. Um, and uh, Ian McDonald shows up, and I, I showed him the letter, and, you know, I said, you know, and, uh, uh, and that's kind of like where I really fell in love with the whole idea yeah. of, of making whiskey. And those smells I had never smelled before, the machinery, you know, the, the sounds of the distillery, everything was just fabulous. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm glad you kind of that experience has stayed with you so kind of vividly. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so... As a beginner, then, is there anything you kind of need to know before you go to try kind of start exploring or tasting? Where where do you start then? Uh, almost anywhere. Um, the, the the most important thing is to find out what it is that you like and what it is you don't like, and you're not obligated to like any of it. So the number one thing I tell people to do is stay away from this thing right here. Okay. Right? So this is what you may call a shot glass, but I refer to it as an alcohol delivery device. It's an ADD. <laughs> so, <laughs> this does nothing. This does nothing to enhance um, the smell and, and flavor. What you're looking for is to approach it like wine, but respecting the fact that it's a higher proof. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's pretty much... So wine has a whole array of smells and has a whole array of tastes. Um, when you say the word wine, it covers a massively wide spectrum of flavor, and so does whiskey. Whiskey covers a massively, massively wide spectrum. So you can look at it, look at it like the spectrum, a color spectrum. You know? um, the, there's a, a couple um, myths to deal with. For example, all scotch is smoky. Of course not. Um, uh, As a matter of fact, of all of the malt distilleries in Scotland that make whiskey, if I were to put them on the face of a clock and I started at noon and I went around clockwise in order of their peatiness, like starting at noon with zero peating and then went all the way around to midnight, at what time do you think that I would actually start to, start to taste smoke and peat? Oh, good question. Let's go six. Let's go right down the middle. Okay. Actually, it's about 9.30. Okay. Yeah. So that means three quarters of the whiskeys that are coming from Scotland are don't have any discernible smokiness or peatiness in them. Right. Okay, yeah. So a lot of uh, so that's one of the things to, to discover. Um, um, the other thing is the glassware that you use. You're looking for some, there's a lot of whiskey glasses out on the market. Uh, a nice little white wine glass is a perfect glass. Um, the thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to stick your nose into the glass because what's coming out of that glass that you 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 can, you'll sense it, but you can't see it, obviously, is all the ethanol, you know, which is right. minimum 40%. And some of these whiskeys are now presented at cast strength, which is going to be in the, the 50 to the 60% alcohol. Yeah. So all of that is actually just streaming out, you know, of the of the glass. And if you stick your nose in there, you're just going to get um, yeah. what's called a, a nausea, which is a sort of a temporary nose blindness. So you want to keep the glass down here. You want to keep your mouth open so that you're <clears throat> you're utilizing um, your entire nasal cavity, and it's not just all about the nose. And um, and just start kind of like you know, a do I like it? Number one, that's number number one. Right? Yeah. And if I like it, you know, what's the primary thing I'm smelling? In here? Is it sweet? Is it bitter? Is it salty? Is it sour? Is it, you know, our, our nose has the ability to pick up a whole bit, just a wide range of, of flavors. Yeah. And then let's say, okay, it, it's fruity. Okay, well, that's interesting. Well, then what kind of fruit is that? So yeah. is that an apple? Is that a peach? You know, 
and then you can kind of keep going down there. So that's like a fun little game to play. Yeah. When you when you drink it, um, remember that uh, whiskey was given to us by the gods to slow us down. So the whole idea here yeah. is to hold on to it and yeah. don't be in a in a rush to you know don't don't you know we all learned whiskey the wrong way. We learn how to do that real quick. Yeah. Down <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, it's uh, uh, but now it's like, like wine, uh, you know, it, you're going to luxuriate it. Uh, the other thing about whiskey is that water um, is its best friend. Okay. So if whiskey is too powerful for you, if it's even if it's got some smoke that you want to get out of the way, then you start dropping some water, in, you know, preferably with a, a, a dropper or something like that, or, yeah. you know, a, a, a little plastic bottle cap you can put in there. Yeah, and get the whiskey down to the point where it's enjoyable for you. Because again, it, mm-hmm. it's high alcohol. Yeah, um, you're there. You're trying to enhance the flavor. You're trying to bring out as many flavors as possible. And uh, and the best of all, um, do it with people that you like, um, <laughs> because um, our uh, our circumstances and our atmosphere have a whole lot to do with how we taste and smell things. So if you're with people that you enjoy, somehow everything just tastes a whole lot better. That makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I always, I always recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. So that that's this real secret then. <laughs> that's the real secret, yeah. Yeah. So obviously you spoke there about adding a wee drop of water to to your whiskey. So is that how you would usually? drink the whiskey or would you have it neat on the rocks or always just with that little drop of it it literally depends on the whiskey um so one of the first things that i do is um i open up a bottle of whiskey and i look at the proof and the proof is again like i said it's it's minimum 40 percent, but it can go up to 63 64 percent yeah uh, depending if it's like a cast strength which means they did nothing to dilute it down when they poured it out of the cask and, and you know so um so that's the first thing i'm going to do now the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to taste it the way that the whiskey maker wanted me to taste it so i'm going to give that person their due you know mm-hmm. uh, they put a lot of time they put a lot of effort a lot of thought into making that whiskey so i want to taste it the way that they wanted me to experience it when they put it in that bottle that's the first thing i'm going to do after that all the rules are off the table. Okay. You know, some whiskeys are better in um, on the rocks. You know, um, I don't recommend putting a lot of ice in there. Maybe one rock, uh, just to kind of get a little chill. And what you're looking for is just a slow dilution of the whiskey yeah. with a, a, a slowly melting. So I like, you know, like a big cube or a ball or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, some whiskeys are great, and like for example, Japanese whiskeys were designed to be drunk with soda water. Okay. So uh, there's something that your your parents or your grandparents may have drunk when they were young, and that is called a highball. Um, oh, and yeah. in, in many in in Scotland, I believe they call it a Presbyterian. <laughs> and um, so it's essentially whiskey uh, and ice in a tall glass. It's called a long drink, and it would be either ginger ale or soda water or a Presbyterian is a combination of both of those. Uh, in Japan, uh, it's called a Mizuari, and it's just one of the most wonderful drinks. It's three ingredients. It's ice, it's whiskey, and soda water. It's about oh. the, um, you know, the, the ratio of, mm-hmm. uh, of them, and it's refreshing. You, you, you get the taste of the whiskey. Um, it's drinkable. Um, you can have a couple of them uh, yeah. without worrying about you know getting you know too over the hill there. Um, yeah. so, so so every whiskey will kind of tell you, and every scenario will kind of tell you how to drink that whiskey at that particular time. Um, so the you know the, if you want to in Japan where they drink whiskey the way that we in America drink wine and beer, they drink it with everything, and they drink it typically in a diluted state. Uh, as mm-hmm. food accompaniment, uh, they're drinking it with uh, soda water. They're drinking it with green tea. They're drinking it with uh, coconut water. So oh. experiment, 
you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's your bottle. Don't let the knucklehead at the end of the bar tell you how to drink it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's a good way, like you say, taste it here and then experiment, see what you like, you know. Yeah. And, you know, your palate, your palate today uh, is not your palate on Thursday night. Yeah. And it's not your palate on Sunday afternoon. So you, 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 yeah. you taste different things at different parts of the day. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so everything changes. Uh, it's, when you start looking at it that way, it's really wonderful because one whiskey you can drink four or five different ways. Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. And enjoy it, you know, completely differently every time. Yeah, so you don't need a large collection to be able to kind of make it feel different. So No, yeah. no not at all. You don't need to be like me. I, I you know, <laughs> I've got my, I now have too many bottles. I don't, you know, I, I have to just invite strangers to my house. Just to <laughs> because I, oh, well, there you go. Some of our listener, listeners will be heading over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, um, we didn't tell them where I lived, did we? <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, you're lucky we didn't Close. give out your real address. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I saw that you even created a whiskey themed comedy show called The Story of Whiskey, which was billed yeah. as 60 minutes of bad stand up comedy punk, punctuated by drinking. So I'm very intrigued. Can you tell me more? <laughs> well, it, it sort of came out of my class that I was doing. Uh, the class was a two hour class and we typically did, um, it was called Whiskey Smackdowns. And it was a comparison of one whiskey versus another. So I would do whiskey okay. smackdown, Scotch versus bourbon, Irish versus Japanese, uh, world whiskeys, you know, craft whiskeys, all these things. Mm. Um, my take on whiskey is that, you know, uh, I'm in the entertainment field here. And if we're not entertaining people, then, you know, we're really missing a good part of this. It is whiskey after all. I'm not lecturing on, you know, on, on, uh, on heart surgery. You know, exactly. so, yeah. so with that, um, I take a pretty, and I, you know, I, I started out as an actor. I was a stand up comic uh, in the early days of stand up comedy. So, you know, I, I know my way around a, a, a joke, a, a setup, a punchline. I can, and so yeah. it just it was inevitable that my attitude toward whiskey is let's don't take this seriously. Um, uh, that, you know, these would come together. And someone had asked me, uh, a guy was running a, a whiskey festival in, in Minneapolis, and he was just kicking this thing off. And typically at whiskey festivals, they will have these master classes that run alongside of the general tasting. So you pay yeah. one ticket, you get into the event, and you know you're there for four hours, table to table to table, taste, 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 and then you can go to like a thirty or forty-five minute master class that a distiller or a blender or a brand ambassador is doing about one particular whiskey and you can sit down, you get kind of like an intensive. So I thought, well, let's do something fun about that. Let me just take the class. And instead of concentrating on one whiskey or one style, let's do the entire story of whiskey based on the five largest um, whiskey makers. So in, in, in the story of whiskey, I have um, one Irish whiskey, a Scottish whiskey, a, a, um, a Canadian, an American whiskey, a Japanese whiskey. And then I've got one whiskey from the world that represents the world. And I tell the entire story. And again, I use a lot of that for, for the book. And I, when, when I, in the first chapter of the book, which is called The World of Whiskey, um, I talk about the history of whiskey, where it came from, where distillation came from, how we got to this point where the word came from, how all of this stuff evolved, how much we really owe the monks, because the monks were really incredibly important to get us to this point today. Um, and so all of these, and so I turned it, and you know, the more you say things after a while, the more comfortable you get with it, and the more you start playing around with it. Yeah. And I started doing it, you know, at, at, at whiskey festival after whiskey festival after whiskey festival after whiskey festival. And then I was brought in to do it for bar staff trainings. I was brought in to do it for a whole bunch of private events. When the book came out, it was a perfect vehicle to, um, to promote the book. 
So I would come in, I would do the story of whiskey, I would have a stack of books there, I would sign the books afterwards. And um, so I've probably, I think I've done it maybe about 100 times, um, yeah. you know, uh, since I conceived of it. And, um, and then when COVID hit, um, I did it online. You know, I brought the whole thing online and I did it in Zoom tastings for private uh, corporations that were looking to entertain all of their at-home employees. Um, so, yeah. So, um, and, and again, it's a goofy cake. I get to, I get to, to really, I get, I get to say really bad puns. Um, <laughs> I get to make people groan. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we get to have fun with it, which is really the whole idea. Oh, and so have you or will you ever bring the show over to the, the big comedy fringe festival here in Edinburgh? You know, you mentioned that in the email and I never thought of that, but it's absolutely perfect for that. And yeah. so, oh, yes, I'm go. going to. And yeah. after this interview is over, you're going to help set me, help me get that set up. Because if you know okay. anybody at the fringe, if you know anybody, yeah. at the, this would be perfect at the fringe festival. They well, that, yeah, as soon as I saw that, I was like, yeah, that, that seems perfect. I mean, because obviously being, um, I'm maybe about an hour south of Edinburgh, so we take full of, but oh. primarily it's a lot of international visitors, so they, yeah. they would want to, to hear about it, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, everyone has oh, a great God. time for it. <laughs> What's that? We've got a plan coming together for you then. <laughs> I, I, I'm liking it. I am yeah. liking it. You know, and as the, w the way that I always did the class uh, was the exact way that, um, th that, I do, um, uh, that I do these events, which is, and the same way as the book, um, as I found this middle way of, um, uh, of bringing in newbies and keeping the connoisseurs um, uh, engaged. Um, and I learned this actually in technology. I learned it in, uh, when I was a tech sales guy, because, um, I did most of my presentations to high end executives. And if you come into a presentation with a CEO and a CFO and a CMO, and you start talking technology, you've lost them in the first two minutes. That's the last thing that these guys want to hear is tech talk, right? So you have to come in and really define the issue in their terms and get to know, you know what keeps them up at night. And, you know, a chief marketing officer and a chief financial officer, they have, you know, different concerns and the CEO is looking at it completely different. So when you start looking at it that way, then you start taking the information that you have and presenting it as in the way that they want to hear, not the way that you want to say it. And so that's, mm -hmm. I brought that over to whiskey and, and, and it's really worked out very well for me. And the fact that, again, I can do stupid, I can do more stupid <laughs> jokes here than I can in technology works out really well. Oh, yeah, maybe a little more appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. I, I did a stupid joke with a, 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 a very, a, a very high powered uh, presentation and it just landed like a thud in the room. I said, yeah. okay, well, I'm just going to take that one out of the script right there. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, you tried it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I know you're not long back from a trip to Scotland. So how did you enjoy your visit? Well, again, this was a, a visit that uh, I had been looking forward to for six, seven years. Um, so I, I visited the, the Springbank Distillery in Campbellton, and I was um, I, I took part in whiskey school. Now, this is a very highly competitive spot to get one of six spots in which you pay to do their work for them at the distillery. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and it was, uh, you know, I, I was accepted into the class of 2020 after like three or four years of, you know, getting waitlisted. And obviously yeah. that didn't work out too well. So that finally got pushed to, to 2022. But it was just one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had um, uh, is Spring Bank, for those people who don't know it, is a small little distillery in the Campbellton area, uh, uh, the town of Campbellton, which is in the Kintyre Peninsula. Um, 
and at one time was the biggest whiskey producing area in Scotland. As a matter of fact, uh, there were more uh, there was more money in Campbellton than there was in all of the UK because of all of the whiskey that was in the bonding warehouses. Um, and then over the years uh, and the decades, it was reduced down to one. And that was Springbank that had been there since 1828. And what's wonderful about Springbank is everything is non-automated. It's all done in a very Victorian style. Um, especially all of the malting of the barley, which is done on their own floors. Everything comes off. Uh, everything that goes into that uh, into that bottle came off that malting floor. Um, three big, massive pot stills. They make three styles of whiskey, Springbank, Long Row, and um, um, Hazelburn. And, and Long Row and Hazelburn are named after two of the closed distilleries from Campbellton. So it has this wonderful geeky cult feel around it, and yeah. and 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 I always refer to Springbank drinkers as cultists because they're so incredibly singularly focused and passionate about it. So to get the opportunity to go there and work with them, you know, uh, do the work with them. Now, obviously, we were playing at it. You know, uh, uh, they moved us around day to day, but you get to really understand, you know, and I come from a factory town. I come from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I grew up and worked in the steel mills and other types of, of, of factory yeah. manufacturing work um, when I was younger. Um, so I really, you get this feel about, you know, this is made by hand. And this yeah. is made by decisions that men and women make together um, over a long period of time. And there's a tradition that goes uh, with that. And there's a, um, a sense of meaning. Um, and this is a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a factory town. Everybody who works at Spring Bank, you know, is from Campbellton or from the surrounding areas. So it was just in a wonderful bathing in a culture uh, of a blue collar culture um, uh, that makes one of the most coveted um, whiskeys uh, in the world. And it was, you know, absolutely just a terrific uh, opportunity. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And so when when you're here in Scotland, other than distilleries, what, what kind of food or places do you want to go and explore while you're here? Well, Scotland for me is um, is the physical beauty of Scotland. So uh, anytime I can go out and, and 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 you know up in the Highlands and just be part of the the, the physicalness, the rawness, the roughness of it. Um, uh, my family, the Robinsons, uh, half my, half my family are Scots Irish. So I've done an enormous amount of study uh, about the, 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 the uh, about Scots and um, uh, the, the early Alba. You know, um, yeah. and and all the way back to the Pictish people. You know, who I'm absolutely, you know, fascinated by. Yeah. Um, so uh, anywhere where I can actually, you know, get myself involved in the culture of it, um, I love uh, Edinburgh. Obviously, uh, to me, it's just you know, it's a spectacular, one of the most beautiful cities uh, on the face of the earth, um, and. Um, so yeah, I, I just love being there. You know, I hung out in George Square in Glasgow for like a whole afternoon and just like did people watching and uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, it just yeah. Anywhere where where I'm at, I'm, I'm you know I love the, the museums uh, the, in, in Edinburgh, uh, the, uh, the Scottish National Museum there, oh, uh, beautiful museum. Um, so yeah, uh, the architecture, you know, the statuary, uh, you know. So I'm just yeah a, a huge a huge fan um, of of all of that you know and like you know walking through uh, the the streets of Campbelltown you know I mean it, it you squint your eyes and it takes you right back to you know 150 200 years ago yeah um, to you know and it, it in, in many ways it hasn't changed you know um, yeah. and so that little jump back into history is always you know. Uh, for me, it's very uh, always fascinating. Yeah, and I think we take it uh, for granted, really, because we've just grown up surrounded by it, and it's not really until you go away from Scotland or until you spend time with people 
visiting Scotland that you really kind of realize, I actually know this is really special. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. Uh, you know, and, and the other thing is, like, you know, America is a new country, um, mm. uh, relatively. So when when you look at like just the architecture here, for something to be 150 years old here, that's a rare thing. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But you know, you Campbelltown, the entire, you know, the, 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 you you can mm-hmm. tell, you could saw, you saw how someone physically laid that uh, granite block in that street, and it's yeah. still there. And then all of the wooden wheels that had that had you know had gone over that, and now here comes all of these trucks and and and, yeah. uh, and, and automobiles. Um, so yeah, you really you know really getting that sense of permanence and and mm. what people yeah. have done. Um, yeah. uh, to me, it's just yeah, it's, it's a great great part of the country. Oh, definitely. And so for any Scots wanting to learn more about American whiskey, is there anywhere, I, I think I might have an idea where you're going to say, but is there anywhere that you need to come for an American whiskey themed trip? My guess is well, kind that, of like, <laughs> well, well, yeah, I mean, like, obviously the first, the, the, you would think the first destination would be Kentucky. Um, uh, and, and Kentucky bourbon is, uh, it, 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 you know, they're the spiritual godfathers of American whiskey right there. But American whiskey started in Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, it was started in, you know, in kind of like in my hometown of Western Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. Um, the first American whiskey was really rye, and I know some people in Kentucky will argue with that. Um, mm-hmm. But rye whiskey was the first real commercially popular one. Then there's Canadian whiskey. It's a whole other animal up there. You can go to Windsor, Canada, which is right across the river from Detroit, Michigan. And okay. that's the, the old Hiram Walker distillery that is still there that give you an entire sense of history of Canadian whiskey. The wonderful thing about what happened in America about 20 years ago is that um, there was a whole new generation of people who rediscovered whiskey. And then with a sense of DIY, do it yourself and frustration with whatever that they were doing in their lives, decided to say, screw it, I'm done, I'm going to make whiskey, I'm going to make vodka, I'm going to make gin, uh, I'm going to make something here, and started up an industry that has changed the world. Yeah. And I'll give you an example of, um, of what that is. In order to distill in the United States, you have to have a federally granted license called a distilled spirits producer or DSP license. That tells the federal government, I'm not going to blow the place up, and I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm zoned in the yeah. right place. And in the United States, in the year 2000, there were approximately 60 of those six zero, and that includes the big, massive ethanol plants, and you know, the the, the eight or ten mm-hmm. guys that were in Kentucky. We've quit counting now at 2,100 wow. in the United yeah. States. So wow. there's been like a, a nuclear explosion of distilleries. Yeah. And New York and California lead the pack. Pennsylvania yeah. is number five. Colorado is number three, right? Um, so there's there's distilling going on in every part of the, uh, of the United States right now. Um, mm-hmm. Massachusetts has quite a few of them. Um, Virginia, you know, um, New Jersey, for some reason, is not really getting behind it as much. And so they're kind of like a, a, a more of a laggard. But uh, New York State, uh, there's close to 200, you know, 200 wow. distillers. In New York City, there are eight just in New York, in the five boroughs of New York City. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So uh, you can almost land anywhere. Yeah. And exactly. take a distillery tour and buy some local uh, a, a locally made uh, a liquor of some sort. Um, yeah. Very much the way that wine was back in the 1980s. You know, there was a big wine explosion in the 1980s, and now it's, now it's uh, food. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. So wherever you're traveling in the States, you're, you're going to find somewhere to visit. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I would, I would recommend um, if you go up to one website called distiller.org, Okay. And uh, it's it's the website for the um, uh, American Distillers um, uh, 
uh, ADI, uh, American Distillers. Uh, I can't remember what I stands for, um, but it's a it's a it's an association of distillers. And what they've done is, uh, when you become a member of them, um, they put your dot on a map, and then they have a map. Yeah. And you can go up there and you can take a look at the map of all the distilleries around and you can plan, uh, you know, you can go to Texas and do a Texas distillery tour. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. have thought that there would be, I mean, obviously it's a, a massive country with so much going on, but you wouldn't expect there just to be that kind of range right across, you know, where oh, you're right. always, it's, you know, it's like, like it's all brand new. It's all mm -hmm. brand new. And, yeah. That's what was exciting. That's one of the reasons that, um, you know, that I do what I do right now. So I'm a consultant. These are my, essentially, all of these distilleries are, are potential clients. Of mine. Yeah. Um, and when I saw it coming, and at the time I was with Compass Box, and Compass Box was the only small producer that had that sort of mentality. Iconoclastic, we're changing the rules where we're respecting tradition, but we're looking at the future. We're looking at this completely differently. And I was out there, I had, I had to spell the word artisanal, you know, when I first stuck it out. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then I saw little by little these small distilleries opening up here in the Hudson Valley, up here in New York, and then in Brooklyn, and then somewhere else in Texas and Denver. And I said, that, that's going to be the future. That's going to change everything. And yeah. when you see what it had done, it started a revolution. And the first question you asked me today about whiskey from other parts of the world, that was the outgrowth of that. And then you yeah. look at Scotland. Scotland was closing distilleries down in the 1980s yeah. due to the whiskey law, right? Mm -hmm. And then now Scotland has about 145 distilleries. Now yeah. they were down to 119 about 10 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ireland okay. has gone from three to, to 50. Wow. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in 15 years. So, boom. It's yeah. just, it's, it's massive. It's a wonderful yeah. explosion. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like it. Definitely. I was just going to say thank you so much for joining me, Robin, and, and sharing your insights and story. I definitely feel like I've, I've uh, got a few plans now to, to kind of like you say, go and explore what it is that I like and, and take it from there. I'm just going to add on to that. It is an explanation. Uh, it, it is an exploration. It's a journey without a destination. There you go. Exactly. No end point. Just just keep keep exploring. So, yeah. yeah. And so how can people follow you for more fantastic whiskey facts? And, and where can they get a hold of the Complete Whiskey course? Uh, so my website is uh, www.robinrobinsonllc.com. So that's actually the name of my, my company. Um, and I, I do a bad job of keeping that currently updated with like my schedule of events, but I'm going to do a better job at that. Um, uh, the book um, is available in the EU. Um, it's available uh, in the UK. Um, it, you can find it online at Amazon. You can find it online at Barnes and Noble uh, if you have uh, access to their uh, their website. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, it, it, I was in like Scotland I, when when I was in Scotland. I noticed that most of the books in Scotland were from uh, European or, or UK authors, and so a lot of the familiar names that I had seen there. Um, yeah. So I, I always go with like uh, my business card and I pitch my book yeah. everywhere I go. <laughs> yeah. um, wow. But uh, it is, we do have distribution there. So um, it's called The Complete Whiskey Course uh, by Robin Rogers. There you go. Well, like I say, thank you so much for joining us, Robin. And I hope everyone listening learned a lot too. <laughs> Well, Emily, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you um, spending this time with me, and thank you very much. Uh, it was great talking with you, and I, I hope to see you again when you're back. Are you now up in the Albany area? Uh, so, yes, I've kind of been going in between the two. So we have our store up in Albany, and then I'm speaking to you today from our headquarters in the Scottish borders. So traveling between well, the two. <laughs> Well, let me know the next time you're in the New York area, and uh, I'll make a couple of recommendations. And it's only two hours away from me, so um, 
I want to. I want to. I want to introduce you to a really awesome little whiskey shop in Saratoga Springs. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. that sounds great. I look Good. forward to it. <laughs>